Greetings, everybody! T. Prower once again. The day has finally arrived. With the premiere of My Little Pony, A New Generation, we've officially entered Generation 5. It's been a long time coming, with a lot of hype and build-up, and now it's finally upon us. Did I like this movie? Like it? I loved it! In my opinion, it was well worth the wait, and was even better than I expected. I think G5 is going to turn out alright, if the movie's our starting point. Now, if you know me, this isn't going to be conventional review, at least not by the standards of actual movie reviews. I just prefer to summarize and point out my thoughts or feelings on certain bits. If that still technically makes it a review, then I guess it's just a matter of semantics. So, without further ado, let's get to it! We begin with a really nice 2D animated sequence showcasing the main six of G4, even having Tara, Ashley, Andrea, and Tabitha reprise their roles. Things take a turn for the weird, though, as Rarity starts going nuts. And not in the usual drama queen way, but more like the inspiration manifestation way. Just can't have Rarity without her stealing the spotlight, can we? Turns out this is just playtime between Little Sunny Star Scout and her two friends. It's Trailblazer and Sprout. Sunny, of course, is trying to play with her main six toys the way we would know them. But Sprout's been heavily influenced by what Earth Ponies these days are taught that unicorns and pegasi are dangerous. Poor Hitch is caught in the middle, wanting to be friends with both Sprout and Sunny, but feeling more inclined to side with the former. As it turns out, Sunny and her dad, Argyle, are the only ponies in Maritime Bay who don't follow the beliefs of the other Earth ponies, and Sprout's mother, Phyllis Cloverleaf, believes Argyle needs to stop filling his daughter's head with contrary ideas. Thankfully, Argyle is not the least put off by Phyllis' attitude, and simply says he'll leave the brainwashing to her. The bond between Argyle and his little Sunny Bunny, which is an absolutely adorable nickname, though I'll stick with my nickname for Sunny, Sunshine, is so cute to witness, as both hope to help more ponies understand Unicorn and Pegasi the way they do. The two write a letter to Unicorns and Pegasi together, and send it on its way to hopefully come across some pony and invite them to Maritime Bay. It kind of reminds me of that scene in James and the Giant Peach, when James creates that little paper bag balloon while he sings about someday making friends from far away. Argyle's also quite handy, as he creates a working mobile lamp that projects images of ponies on the walls in a very nice display. After telling Sunny her favorite story about ancient Equestria, when all three tribes were still friends, he reaffirms the promise that someday, they'll come back together again. They'll do their part, hoof to heart. Years later, however, it seems Argyle has passed away, as a now grown-up Sunny's living by herself, keeping his glasses and their favorite picture as a memento, writing said picture every time it goes crooked. Heartbreaking, really, to think he's gone. But his teachings haven't been forgotten by his little girl, and we certainly won't forget them. We see Sunny go out to start a brand new day, roller skiing in a maritime bay to sell smoothies, while singing our first song, Gonna Be My Day. During it, we see Sprout doing his damnedest to try and keep up with her, with little success. We also see glimpses of the other Earth ponies showing fear and contempt for the imagery of Pegasi and unicorns, much to Sunny's discomfort and irritation. She really does seem to be the only one who hasn't bought into the paranoia. She also seems to have made a public nuisance of herself, according to natural animal magnet Sheriff Donut Lord, aka Hitch. Sprout had hoped to be Sheriff himself, but he's Hitch's deputy. Every year, there's a public demonstration of new technology at Phyllis's company, K-5, 
counter logic. And Sunny tries to find some way to sneak in and disrupt it. Well, Hitch and Sprout aren't having it, and they bar Sunny from even stepping hoof inside on Phyllis's orders. Hitch even makes an earnest appeal as Sonny's friend, not simply as a sheriff. However, Sonny didn't come all this way just to give up. Canterlogic specializes in technology designed to protect Earth ponies from Unicorn and Pegasus attacks. Because, as Phyllis says, to be scared is to be prepared. She showcases these inventions in fashion show style in complete seriousness. Whether they're practical or not, even when one poor pony is carried off by a bunch of balloons. Sunny pops up to make a speech encouraging friendship between the three races, and ends up getting caught in the middle of more product testing, where she's saved by Hitch's intervention. She tries to convince the other ponies to be more open minded, but unfortunately, Phyllis's words are stronger, and Sunny's pleas fall on deaf ears as Hitch takes her away. He makes it clear that while he does value his friendship with her, and despite being a pillar of inspiration for other ponies, something Sonny wishes he could use to promote open-mindedness, he also has to uphold the law. And by what Maritime Bay law dictates, Sonny's in the wrong. He also points out that Sonny has no way of proving that things would magically change should ponies listen to her speeches. He's clearly torn up about it, since it puts him at odds with his best friend. But he's long accepted the town's opinion that the unity between the three races never happened, and never will. And he doesn't want Sunny to lose the only friend she has left in Maritime. Without Argyle around, Sunny must feel incredibly lonely, like a minority of one in a world of paranoia and rumor-mongering. But it's here that she finally comes to town. Izzy Moonbow. Or, as I like to nickname her, Izzy Bell. Striding into Maritime Bay as bold as brass. Her appearance naturally caused a town-wide panic, forcing Hitch and Sprout, though mostly Hitch, to try and calm things down and neutralize the threat, setting off traps to catch the adorably oblivious intruder. They do manage to catch her, but... In front of every pony, disobeying Hitch's warnings, Sunny releases Izzy and takes her back to her home. The official first meeting between Sunny and Izzy is all kinds of adorable, from Izzy's attempt to have a staring contest with Sunny, and coming close to a kiss, I might add, to Sunny having 142 questions she's always wanted to ask a unicorn. She's even torn up about how to feel about having liberated a unicorn and bring her to her house. Should she be excited about a dream come true? Or horrified at what a traitor this makes her to her fellow Earth ponies? It reminds me of Rapunzel's mood swings when she left her tower entangled. Much as one should be impressed at Izzy opening a can of beans with her horn, Sunny's disappointed to learn she doesn't actually have any magic to show. But before she can hear why, Hitch and Sprout show up to arrest the two. Thanks to a distraction courtesy of Izzy, the two new friends slash fugitives make a run for it, leaving Maritime Bay behind. Sunny soon learns that all unicorns lost their magic a long time ago, though no one knows why. She also learns that unicorns have their own prejudices about the other races, believing that earth ponies are smelly and slow-witted, and pegasi are sneaky magic thieves. Sunny decides that they need answers, and the best place to start is the Pegasus capital of Zephyr Heights. Izzy's hesitant about it, but gets the right encouragement during the next song, I'm Looking Out For You, and our two mares begin their long journey to bring magic and friendship back. Meanwhile, Hitch decides to go out and bring Sunny back to Maritime Bay, even if it means arresting her for breaking the law so severely. He tasks Sprout with staying behind to keep the peace in his stead, and after he's gone, we see that Sprout's grown resentful of being Hitch's deputy, Jealous of the glory and attention he's gotten. A visit from dear mother Phyllis exacerbates this, as Hitch's absence means that he's now the sheriff, and that starts giving him ideas. He has a fitting name in that regard, as his mother helped plant the seed for his ego, and her coddling has caused it to sprout. 
Meanwhile, up in the mountains, we learn that Izzy can sense the sparkle, basically the natural aura of a pony, which shines brighter the happier they are. Sunny's is apparently lavender, which calls a certain princess to mind if you think about it. But their talk is interrupted by the arrival of Zip Storm, who's outperforming parkour. While she's intrigued with being a unicorn and earth pony, she's forced to flee at the arrival of fan-favorite Royal Pegasus guards, Zoom, Zephyrwing, and Thunder, who apprehend Sunny and Izzy, and finally give us an explanation for the tennis ball Izzy had in her horn. It's apparently considered useful in blocking magic. I wonder how long it took them to come to that conclusion, or what else they considered before landing on that one. Despite being under arrest, the two mares, and consequently we, get a nice view of Zephyr Heights, and learn that a gala event is taking place that very night in honor of Queen Haven, with a special performance by her trendiness, the beloved Princess Pip Petals, who gives a public shout out to her adoring Pip Squeaks, promising a special song of the performance. Now, while I'm on the subject of Pip, I find it interesting that she's shorter and chubbier than the rest of the main five, especially since she's Zip's twin. But honestly, it's a nice bit of physical diversity, especially considering how the ponies of G4 tend to use the same Flash-made body models. No mention is made of her difference in size in the movie, so no one sees anything to comment on about it. And so, Sunny and Izzy are taken before Queen Haven, Pip, Zip, and the royal dog, Cloudpuff. Queen Haven is naturally distressed at having outsiders in her kingdom, not helped by Pip live-streaming their appearance. When Sunny tries questioning her about magic, she has them sent to the dungeon, confiscating Sunny's journal in the process. This whole exchange makes Zip uncomfortable, but she has no choice but to follow her mother and sister as the two mares are escorted away. Sunny, tempting fate in true MLP fashion, wonders what else could go wrong. Well, about that. Sprout has fully committed to his role as sheriff, despite the rest of the townsfolk wanting Hitchback to feel safe. He manages to rally them together by playing on their fears, saying the unicorns and Pegasi could attack at any time, and they need to be prepared to fight back. Through his song, Danger Danger, or Angry Mob, he mobilizes them into, well, an angry mob, cementing himself as the true villain of this movie, something I never would have seen coming. Very nice twist, I have to say. After an unexpected bit showing that Pip even has a perfume advertising her name, we find the dungeons of Zephyr Heights are actually pretty cozy, despite the circumstances. Sunny, however, is more interested in why she doesn't see any Pegasi, apart from the royal family, flying. Her coolness, Princess Zip, or just Zip, suddenly arrives, expressing an interest in magic and showing that she obtained Sunny's originally Argyle's journal, which bears a very familiar mark on its cover. They're briefly interrupted by Pip, who scolds Zip for fraternizing with the prisoners, while she only came by for the content. When asked why other Pegasi don't fly, she confirms for them that only the royal family is able to fly, though a moment of hesitation on her part says otherwise. And she does express a wish to give the other Pegasi a chance to fly, it's pretty easy to see the contrast between these two, as Pip enjoys living it up as a princess with a strong social presence, whereas Zip's more than happy to try and get away from it all, and leave the princessing to her. Once Pip leaves her dress rehearsal, Zip releases Sunny and Izzy and has them follow her. Though not before Izzy leaves her tennis ball behind in exchange for an orange. Silly girl. Meanwhile, Hitch has trekked all the way to Zephyr Heights, intent on bringing Sunny and Izzy into custody, while managing to gather an appreciative audience of bunnies. It takes him a bit to notice through his grand speechifying, but he soon discovers that he's come to the right place, as loudly advertised around the city. Back with the fugitives, Zip takes him to a secret room that appears to have been an abandoned travel station, back when Zephyr Heights welcomed all ponies, proving Argyle right. In a bittersweet bit of nostalgia, we even see an old Wonderbolts poster, making one wonder if they're even still a thing anymore, or how long they've been out of action. And it's here that Zip reveals the truth. 
Not even the royal family can fly. They've been faking it via wires. She's tired of living a lie, and likely resents the fact that Pip's eager to keep up that lie. That's why she gets away, to clear her head of the pretense, and to stretch her wings and glide via wind power. It's this freedom that really causes her sparkle to shine, according to Izzy. But the real reason Zip brought Sunny and Izzy there is to show them stained glass windows depicting ponies holding aloft gemstones under an image of Twilight's cutie mark. Only two are there, and only the Pegasus window was undamaged. Nevertheless, they now see that there's a Pegasus crystal and a unicorn crystal, and they fit together. Sunny determines that reuniting them is the key to returning magic and uni to Equestria. It makes you wonder if the elements of Harmony underwent another change into these crystals. Harmony always did work in mysterious ways. Unfortunately, getting the Pegasus crystal won't be easy, as it's part of Queen Haven's crown, and she never takes it off. However, there is a way. Pip's performance at the Royal Gal will keep everyone's attention on her, including the Queen's. And thus, a heist plan is born. Izzy crafts a fake crown to swap for the real one, and Zip creates enough of a distraction to allow Sunny and Izzy to sneak in. And when the show starts, all they have to do is make the switch. Easy breezy, right? Zip tries to talk to her mother about the disappearance of magic, but Queen Haven brushes her off, saying that she needs to be more mindful of the needs of their subjects, especially as she's next in line for the throne. Queen Haven only wants to make her subjects feel happy and safe, even if it means living a lie, and it's clear that she values Pip's willingness to go along with said lie. The show begins, and Pip takes center stage with her song, Glowing Up. The crown swap is made, but Cloudpuff spots them and steals the crown, then the crystal, forcing Zip to try and get it back, just as Hitch arrives in disguise to make his arrest. He's briefly distracted by Pip singing, something for the shippers to work with, and his ammo magnetism instantly charms Cloudpuff as well. Sonny and Izzy stumble into the tech booth, scaring the tech operator, which causes the special effects to go haywire no pun intended, and revealing the truth behind the royal family's flying ability to the outrage of the spectators. Sonny and Izzy are discovered, and even Hitch's cover is compromised, forcing them all to flee. Even Zip, who's very reluctant to leave her sister literally hanging, but she's sadly left with little choice if she wants to get the Pegasus crystal out of there. Unfortunately, she leaves it behind. The foursome duck into an alleyway, and just as Hitch is getting apprised of the fact that he's in the presence of a princess, they're interrupted as the news of the recent scandal spreads like wildfire. The pipsqueaks turn on Pip, and even Queen Haven herself is placed under arrest for her deception, <laughs> though she still can't resist posing for a picture. Guess that's where Pip gets it from. Just when it's discovered the Pegasus crystal has gone missing, a royally pissed off Pip arrives, having grabbed the crystal herself and demanding answers. Just then, news comes in of an APB being put on the two sisters, Queen Haven entreating them to save themselves. Zip implores her little sister to help, and while she doesn't exactly apologize for what just happened, it's clear she feels bad using her little sister as a pawn and turning her life upside down in a single stroke and hopes the returning magic will make up for everything. Reluctantly, Pip leads him out of the city, followed by an equally reluctant Hitch, filling up stage since he's supposed to be in charge as Sheriff. Back in Maritime, things have gone from bad to worse. Sprout, who has now declared himself Emperor of Maritime Bay, has taken control of his mother's Canterlogic factory, constructing weapons in preparation for an impending attack. Despite Phyllis's pride at how proactive he's being, she's very much worried that he's letting all this power go to his head, especially since Sprout himself said it was her encouragement and support that brought him there. It's interesting to see how things have changed from initial impressions. 
Phyllis may have been clear about her stance on unicorns and pegasi, and set herself up as an antagonist in Sunny's crusade for unity, but all she wanted was to protect her townspeople. Sproul is just taking things to another level. Back with our fugitives, they follow the map in Sunny's journal to find Bridalwood, with Hitch and Pip both taking up the rear in bitter spirits. Zip once again reassures Pip that if they can bring magic back, it'll undo everything that's happened, and Pip will be adored again, showing that she does care about her little sister and wants to make things right. Meanwhile, Hitch discovers that his sheriff's badge has gone missing, though Izzy claims it's for the best, removing an unhealthy power dynamic from their group. They're briefly stopped at a broken bridge and break out into an argument, until Sonny makes them shut up and assures them that once they get magic back, Zip will be able to fly, Pip will get her fans back, and Hitch will get to arrest Sonny, finally pacifying all of them. Meantime, Izzy easily makes a bridge by felling a tree. <laughs> Don't ask me how, it's just Izzy Bell's way. There's a very wholesome scene as the five of them camp out on a cliff, and though Hitch is against joining the girls at first, he's eventually coaxed over when Sonny assures him that she's glad he's there with them as are the rest of them. Izzy, normally the bounciest of the group, becomes rather subdued, since being with these points has been the most fun she's ever had, and she doesn't want the adventure to end. That's something a lot of us can sympathize with when the adventures of the main six ended. She then reveals why she came to Maritime Bay in the first place. She received the lantern letter Sonny and Argyle sent years ago, and came there to hopefully find the new friends the letter promised. It's a sweet reminder to Sonny of the promise she made with Argyle to prove that all ponies were meant to be friends, doing their part, hoof to heart. Looking around at these ponies, it's clear that they've grown close in the short time they've known each other, just as the main six did. Even Pips warmed up to them, in spite of what happened. Hitch is touched as well as he declares he wants to do his part, too, firmly cementing himself as part of the group. The illusion of a magical force is quickly dispelled once they arrive at Bridalwood, looking as gloomy and uninviting as Mirkwood or the Everfree Forest, though nowhere near as deadly. Izzy leads them to her house, which is full of her unicycling creativity, for using whatever material she has on hoof to create masterpieces whether it be paintings, music boxes, mobiles, or even a tea table. However, time is of the essence, and Sunny states they need to look like unicorns if they want to get through Bridalwood to find the unicorn crystal. Well, if it's makeovers they're after, Izzy is more than happy to oblige, as we dive into our next song, Fit Right In. Some things to note with this song. First of all, Izzy with glasses is just adorable. Then again, putting glasses on practically any mare is instant cuteness. Second, we get to hear some more disturbing rumors about what ponies think of each other, including outright cannibalism. I didn't bring this up before, but all these misconceptions that ponies have about each other sound very much like the prejudices the three races had against each other before Equestria was even founded. As Commander Hurricane, Princess Platinum, and Chancellor Puddinghead all shot out before they froze. Looks like history is repeating itself. Just minus the Windigos. Still, Izzy and Sunny manage to get them all in the groove, even Hitch, as Izzy teaches them how to act like unicorns and, as the title of the song says, fit right in. Funny how we now have two MLP songs with that name. Within no time, they're all disguised as unicorns, with some shawls for Pip and Zip to hide their wings, and they're set to venture into Bridalwood, which is just chock full of crystals. Once there, we can see that, like Maritime Bay and Zephyr Heights, the unicorn village has its own eccentricity due to a lack of magic. Unicorns are not only very dour and glum, apart from Izzy, but also very superstitious. Certain forbidden words set them off, causing them to perform an odd ritual to ward off bad luck. They head into the Crystal Tea Room to meet a pony who collects crystals. And while he does know what they're looking for, 
he tells him that the Unicorn Crystal is currently owned by Alpha Bell, the cafe's owner and enthusiast for games. He's amassed quite a collection of trinkets from winning against challengers. To his credit, he doesn't cheat. He's just that good. Sunny, feeling confident in her abilities, challenges Alpha Bill for the crystal, wagering the Pegasus crystal against it. He agrees, challenging her to three rounds of just prance. And because he feels confident in his victory, rather than two out of three, if she beats him in one, she wins. With the competition set to the song from the trailer, It's Alright, Alpha Bill wins the first two rounds pretty handily. But with some timely encouragement from the music-loving Pip, Sunny wins round three, winning the Unicorn Crystal. Unfortunately, their deception is discovered, and Alpha Bill declares it grounds for rendering Sunny's win invalid. Luckily, before things can escalate, Hitch creates a distraction by speaking the forbidden words. Magic, wing, feather, and the big one, mayonnaise! While the unicorns are warding off the Jinxies, the ponies make their escape with both crystals, only to come across Queen Haven, who apparently broke out of prison, Cloudpuff, who brings back Hitch's badge, and the Pegasus guards, who came to arrest the Queen. Caught in the middle of an impending feud between Haven, Alpha Biddle, the Pegasus guards, and the unicorns of Bridalwood, Sunny tries to quell the fighting by putting the two crystals together. But when she does... Nothing happens. It's a harsh blow for Sunny. She had staked all her hopes on this to bring the magic back. To come so far and risk so much. Making enemies of ponies in three cities. Turning her new friends into fugitives and outcasts. Only to fail. Is something she never dreamed of. Dispirited, she returns the crystals to Alpha Bill and Queen Haven apologizing for the trouble she caused. And to their credit, the two look genuinely sad for Sunny. The poor girl goes on to blame herself for everything, believing all she did was make things worse wherever she went, at home and abroad. Not even Izzy pointing out the friendships they managed to make cheers her up. All she feels is guilt for laying them down and getting their hopes up. She returns home, followed by Hitch, leaving Izzy, Pip, and Zip behind. Back in Maritime Bay, Hitch offers Sunny the chance to talk things out with him, but she chooses to return to her home alone, and, in her low spirits, for the first time, she doesn't straighten the picture of her and Argyle. The promise that she had made to reconnect with the other tribes Seems like it can never come true now. It's clear she believes she failed not only her dad, Hitch, and her new friends, but the main six as well, not being able to bring things back to the way they were in their day. She even starts packing up her toys and artwork, fully prepared to commit to the way things are, to accept the fear and separation as the status quo. It's absolutely heartbreaking to watch. Seeing a pony so bright, optimistic, and determined becomes so gloomy and dispirited. But as she moves the artwork away, she notices a familiar symbol in a pedestal on the top floor. At that moment, Argyle's lamp lights up, and, perhaps for the first time ever, she takes a closer look at the crystal uses the lens. It's a perfect fit in the symbol causing it to sink in and make room for the other crystals. Which can only mean one thing. There were three pony crystals, not two. To be fair though, one of the stained glass windows, the one that should have depicted the earth pony crystal, was missing. Besides, earth ponies aren't usually known for having magic of their own, even though we know from G4 that they do, only in a subtler way. Even so, one has to wonder how Argyle got the Earth Pony Crystal in his possession, and if it has something to do with Twilight's symbol on his old journal. The fact this is all part of a lighthouse, though, makes me think its beacon was meant to be a conduit for the Crystal's magic, like the Crystal Heart in the Crystal Empire. 
her spirits rekindled at her discovery, Sunny runs to find Hitch, only to find the entire town mobilized to a militia group, led by Commander-in-Chief Sprout. Sunny tries once again to persuade the town they don't have to be afraid, but not even Hitch's support, nor the revelation that the other tribes have no magic, is enough to sway them from Sprout's commands. Now fully mad with power, he unveils his ultimate weapon, a battle tank dubbed Sprouticus Maximus, which he intends to evade Bridalwood with. Phyllis, meanwhile, is now completely convinced that her son has gone off the deep end. Sonny and Hitch run off to warn the others, only to find Izzy, Pip, Zip, Queen Haven, Alphabetle, the Pegasus Guards, and the Unicorns already in Maritime Bay, just as Sprout and his army corner them. Sonny gets the two crystals back, intending to join them with the last one, the one her father left her. Sprout tries to stop them, but Hitch and Zip go to try and disable his tank, while Sonny, Izzy, and Pip try to put the crystals back together. Unfortunately, Sprout drives straight into the lighthouse, damaging it and scattering the crystals, causing a scramble to reassemble them. Everything is total chaos! With Sprout firing goo bombs from his splatapults, Izzy nearly falling off the lighthouse, and almost getting hit by a splatapult wheel, and Alphabet almost getting run over, thankfully being saved by Queen Haven. Phyllis has finally had enough, and causes Sprout to swerve to avoid hitting her, which unfortunately causes the lighthouse to completely collapse, just as the crystals are united, with still no effect. Luckily, no one's been badly hurt by the fall, but Sonny's home, her father's home, is destroyed, right down to their precious photo. However, the incident has given Sonny clarity. Uniting the crystals themselves won't bring magic and friendship back. It's the ponies themselves who need to come together. It's their choice. They can either continue to live in fear or come together as friends, to choose friendship and love, the true magic that binds them. Her words certainly hit home for the older ponies, and even Sprout looks ashamed of what he's done. In a very heartwarming gesture, one by one, Queen Haven, Alphabetle, and Phyllis move the broken pieces of the picture frame back into place, symbolizing the three tribes coming together again and fulfilling the wish Argyle didn't live to see happen with his own eyes, but surely knew Sonny could still accomplish, doing her part hoof to heart. And that was the key all along. With that simple act, the crystals activate, and their magic transfers into Sonny, granting her wings and a horn in a sudden alicorn transformation, proving that she truly was the one meant to bring the three pony races back together once more. Given the ethereal nature of the wings and horn, I think it's safe to assume this is just a temporary transformation, just like the main six's mega evolutions at the end of season four. As the crystals unite, they send forth a rain boom of magic that spreads all across Equestria, giving magic back to the unicorns and the ability to fly back to the Pegasi. And now, Maritime Bay has become a hub for the three tribes, with Sunny and her friends helping with the cleanup and making plenty of new friends. However, in spite of seeing all the trouble he caused, Sprout still seems desperate for validation that he wasn't a complete screw-up at his job. Validation that even his own mother seems reluctant to give. Hopefully he'll come around and turn his life around after this, and I especially hope he helps contribute to rebuilding Sonny's house, since it's kind of his fault she's homeless now. But this isn't just a victory for Sonny, but for all the main five. Together, they managed to bring back magic and friendship to Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi. And they'll never have to be apart. Hooves to hearts. And hey, that balloon pony came back alright though he seems to have missed the memo of the new status quo. And, in the midst of the credits, we have a small scene of three foals, each representing one of the three races, playing together, with the Earth Pony leaving behind some glowing hoof prints. 
Wonder what that could mean. Besides these three very much resembling what could be the next generation of the Cutie Mark Crusaders. And that, my friends, is our first look at Generation 5 of My Little Pony. A fantastic beginning. And remember, we also have a special and a TV show next year. So there's much to look forward to. Major kudos to the folks behind this movie, from Entertainment One and Boulder Media, Hator Pereira for the music, Alan Schmuckler and Michael Mailer for writing the songs, a special shout-out to Leia Dabzi, a.k.a. Imalu, for her work on character design, and of course, our voice cast. Vanessa Hudgens, Kimiko Glenn, James Marsden, Sophia Carson, Liza Koshi, Ken Jong. Elizabeth Perkins, Jane Krakowski, Phil Lamar, Michael McKean, and one last reprisal of the main six's voice actors. Tara Strong, Ashley Ball, Andrea Libman, and Tabitha St. Germain. I enjoyed everything about this movie. The animation, the characters, the voice cast, the music, the story, the nods, references, and respect paid to G4, all of it blended together into an incredible experience. Now, this really should go without saying, but even though I have higher hopes than ever for G5, it doesn't mean I'll forget G4, nor do I think any of us will. It holds a special place in all of our hearts, after all. I'm not trying to say I'm going to cling to it as if it never ended, of course, but that I still intend to write my stories on it, and talk about it, while also gladly welcoming the adventures of our new main five. Speaking of which, before I close out, let me just take a bit to go over my thoughts on our new cast, now that I've seen them in action and know them better. Sunny is adorable and endearing. The bond she had with her father, and the promise they made together, really make you want to see her succeed and overcome the hardship she's facing and bring friendship and magic back to Equestria, especially since we know she's right about ponies needing to come back together. There's definitely shades of Twilight in her, for several reasons, and some more obvious than others, like the transformation at the end. I think her studiousness would be proud of what she's accomplished. I already loved Izzy when we got to see animations of her, and I love her even more after this. If she's somehow distantly related to Pinky, I wouldn't be in the least surprised. She is such a bubbly cutie, full of optimism, creativity, curiosity, and hilarious lines. She shares Sunny's dream of making new friends, thanks to the letter Sunny sent as a filly. And it's thanks to her that Sunny was able to finally begin her journey to return magic to Equestria. Hitch is a lovable goofball may even more apparent by being the only guy among four mares. While he does showboat a bit, he does take his job as sheriff seriously, and it clearly pains him that it puts him at odds with his best friend. He wants to do what's right, but he has to choose between following the law and following his heart. He also is a natural critter magnet, whether he means it or not. Fluttershy would very much approve. Pip's an endearing cutie herself. She's a bit pampered and is constantly glued to her phone, but she's no spoiled brat. She's a sweet-natured girl who's very devoted to her fan base and has a great talent for singing. Her love of the spotlight brings rarity to mind. She had every right to be upset that her whole world was turned upside down a single night, in spite of the motive behind it but it didn't take her long to forgive and like her new friends, and she committed to the journey wholeheartedly after. Points of Equestria are pretty forgiving in general, and her trendiness is no exception. I did kind of notice that Pip loses a bit of character focus once she joins the group. She's still an important member of the main five, don't get me wrong, and I do still like her, but she doesn't really have as much prominence as the others do when she leaves her cozy life in Zephyr Heights. Hopefully she'll get more chances to shine as the series goes on. She deserves it. 
Zip is definitely the more proactive of the royal sisters, and she greatly earned my respect. She's not simply an athletic royal rebel, but she's also smart, as her official bio says she loves science, and honest, hating having to lie to ponies about being able to fly. Also, from what sources say, she's unsure if others should be a worthy queen when she takes the crown. She was more than willing to let Pip take all the royal attention and let her do her thing, and likely resented the fact that Pip parried her mother's lie about flying. But when push comes to shove, Zip truly does care about her little sister, as well as her new friends. She'd do Rainbow Dash proud with her loyalty, and Applejack with her honesty. As for the rest of the characters, since we were given so little to work with for them in the teasers, I had no idea what to expect. Before this movie, I would never have guessed Phyllis was Sprout's mother, or even that Sprout would end up being the villain. Again, that's a twist I didn't see coming. Hitch's pampered, spoiled mama's boy of a deputy becoming a dangerous threat. But it's a twist I'm glad for, because it would have been a bit cliche if it turned out Queen Haven was a stereotypical wicked monarch trying to hoard magic for herself. On the contrary, while a bit pompous, she only wants what's best for her people, even if it means living a lie to keep their trust, and she's a caring mother to her two daughters. The same goes for Phyllis, who seemed like an antagonist at first, with her opposing Sunny and Argyle's views, but she was only looking out for her fellow Earth ponies, and was nowhere near as nasty as her own son turned out to be. I wondered too where Alpha Bill fit into this, and while it's not clear if he's a village elder or not, he's at least important enough to represent the unicorns as a leader, and clearly values fairness and integrity. And of course, we have Argyle. It's sad to know he's gone in the present, but it was sweet seeing the loving relationship he had with Sunny when she was a foal, inspiring her with his stories about ancient Equestria. I'm confident he's smiling down on Sunny, proud of how far she's come and what she's accomplished. Rest in peace, Argyle. There are still several questions left to be answered, of course. What caused the three tribes to separate in the first place? When exactly did it happen? Why didn't the separation bring back the Wendigos? What happened to the creatures of the Allied Nations? Where did the three pony gems come from? Why did Argyle have a journal with Twilight's cutie mark on it? Why was the lighthouse built to house the crystals? How did he get the Earth Pony crystal? Hopefully, we'll get answers to all these questions when G5 continues next year. But for now, this movie was so worth the wait and the hype, and I'm glad to have seen it. Well, my friends, until next time, see ya!